the Kennedy brothers. Where I go, they stirred the country's blood and maddened their rivals. Bill Sapphire, Richard Nixon's speechwriter, put it this way. When you beat a Kennedy, you beat the best. The trouble was, nobody did. Following the death of Senator Edward Kennedy, here's the hardball political story of how these extraordinary brothers sought the American presidency. Let the word go forth. We have the capacity to make this the best generation. Let us offer new hope. In the 1950s, politics meant men in gray flannel suits, guys like Dwight Eisenhower, Robert Taft, Adlai Stevenson, and Richard Nixon. They were dull, stodgy, sexless. Then in 1956, someone new appeared on the political radar. At the Democratic Convention in Chicago that summer, a young politician battled the old guard for the vice presidential nomination. And in the process, catapulted himself onto the national stage. His name was Jack Kennedy. I want to uh, take this opportunity first to express my appreciation. He was young, alive, great looking. And while he lost the nomination, he wowed the country. He tried to get it. He came very, very close. As it turned out, he did not get it, but he did become overnight a national figure. And then there was his stunningly beautiful wife. For us, 1956 was Jacqueline Kennedy's debut. Well, tell me, were you able to adjust to this? Well, yes, because I've never known anything else since I've been married. No one could ever be counted a loser with her at his side. We also met his family. Boy, did he have lots of brothers and sisters and his fabulously wealthy father. Joseph Kennedy Sr. was our ambassador to Great Britain in the late 1930s, but by 1940, his political career was over. He had nailed himself as a defeatist, or worse, when he predicted that war with Nazi Germany would end democracy in Britain and possibly in the U.S. So his dreams of the White House were now for his sons. So once his own political future was undone, he could pour all of his life energy into those boys. He wanted them to go places that he himself could not have gone. First up was the handsome, hard-charging oldest brother, Joe Jr. He took his first political steps in 1940 as a delegate to the Democratic Presidential Convention. He was on his way. But then the war came, a war that claimed his life when his B-24 bomber exploded in midair during a secret mission to bomb German missile sites. There's no question that Joe Jr. was meant to be the head of the family, and had he lived, he was the one that Joe Sr. thought would have been the man to go into politics and carry that Kennedy legacy into the future. When Joe Jr. died, then that burden of carrying the family legacy fell onto Jack. In 1946, 29-year-old Jack ran for Congress from Massachusetts' 11th District cutting in front of local politicians who had been waiting patiently for the seat to open. The year before he died, while beginning to dictate his memoirs, Jack confessed to having been something of a carpetbagger. I was an outsider, really. I'd never lived very much in the district. My family roots were there, but I had lived in New York for 10 years. And on top of that, I'd gone to Harvard. Not a particularly popular institution at that time in the 11th Congressional District. The Kennedy tactics from 1946 would be used in succeeding campaigns. One was an astute use of public relations, image building. Joe Sr. had been a Hollywood mogul and knew how to promote. He basically was the one who took Hollywood publicity techniques and applied them to politics. Fortunately, Joe Sr. also had a good product to sell. Lieutenant Kennedy had rescued his crew when his PT boat was ran by a Japanese destroyer a story Joe Sr. got reprinted in Reader's Digest and then handed out 100,000 free copies to local voters. To win, there was a willingness by both father and son to do whatever was necessary. Though raised a young aristocrat, Jack found himself trudging up countless triple-decker walk-ups to meet working-class voters. To the amazement of many old hands, the thin, young upstart won. He was part of a new generation of veterans taking power all over the country that year. 
It was clear that Congressman Kennedy was a young man in a hurry. Congressman Kennedy, how do you feel about your race for the Senate up here? Well, I think it's going very well, and of course... Uh... In 1952, only 35 years old, Jack ran for the Senate against Henry Cabot Lodge, the popular incumbent and old-line Boston Brahmin. Kennedy's campaign manager was fellow Irish Catholic Larry O'Brien. My father was only one generation removed from some very bitter experiences. This presented an opportunity for the Irish Catholic community in Massachusetts to step up to the next plateau. The Kennedy campaign exploited the Catholic voters' grudge against patrician Yankees like Lodge. And as they had in 46, the family mobilized. His sisters hosted teas, a chance for aspiring Irish and Italian ladies to share the allure of the celebrated Kennedys. Kennedy ended up defeating Lodge. He was now a U.S. Senator. But it was clear that Jack had a bigger prize in mind. I don't think he had any natural interest in the Senate. I think he felt that uh, if, if this was the game, he wanted to be captain. Kennedy now had his eye on the White House. He recruited the best and the brightest. Speechwriter, Ted Sorensen. Pollster, Lou Harris, advance man, Kenny O'Donnell, and campaign managers, Larry O'Brien and younger brother, Bobby. I believe there's a real trend on now for Senator Kennedy and the Democratic Party. We are extremely encouraged. To make sure his brother's presidential campaign succeeded, Bobby ran interference. Toughness was in the Kennedy DNA, an immigrant's toughness, and Bobby was the least assimilated of them all. The role he found was as the guy who did all the dirty deeds, all the hard stuff, telling people off, telling them to go away, saying no. That allowed Jack to float above the fray. With his impressive campaign team in place, Jack was now ready for the toughest test yet, 1960. register this week to vote, to stand for progress, to move, to move, to go forward until the United States achieves that great goal of practicing what it preaches. For 1960, Jack's campaign team developed a new playbook, one that has become familiar in every presidential campaign since. Use the power of television, and most importantly, take the candidate's case directly to primary voters, unheard of at the time, and used their toughness, political savvy, and money to win it all. It was a campaign like no other. Well, I hope we're going to do well, but I guess we'll know better by uh, the time the votes are counted. They actually made a targeted list based on a cold-blooded kind of cogent analysis of what states might be important, what states they could win in. So he traveled around the country to those states uh, for almost a year. He very rarely, if ever, ran into anybody from any of the competing campaigns. Most other top Democratic candidates, including Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson, didn't campaign in the primaries. They would stubbornly do it the old-fashioned way, working the smoke-filled rooms of the convention hall itself. The question is, would I accept a second spot on the Kennedy ticket? I think the question could have better been put if uh, Kennedy would sec accept the second spot on the Johnson ticket. Johnson did not think Kennedy had any serious chance of being nominated for president because he was a young upstart who was not part of the inner circle or club in the Senate. Kennedy and a popular liberal from Minnesota, Senator Hubert Humphrey, were left alone to contest the early primaries. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the great city of... Charleston, West Virginia. In 1960, the key battleground was West Virginia, a heavily Protestant state where Kennedy's religion would be put to the test. Compared to the cool Jack, Humphrey looked and sounded like a typical politician. This is my wife, Mrs. Johnson. This is Humphrey. How do you do? Mrs. Halstead, glad to see you. As planned, Kennedy's team played up their man's youth and war record contrasting Lieutenant Kennedy's hero status with Humphrey's failure to serve in World War II, a fact that still amuses Kennedy friend Ben Bradley, who served on a destroyer in the Pacific. Humphrey wasn't in World War II. Uh, he wasn't, you know, was, what was he, a hospital mate or something like that? <laughs> you guys are unbelievable. No, but I this mean... This is what I'm talking about. You guys kept score on who was in the front. 
We knew people's war records. We sure did. Remember, Senator John F. Kennedy can be our next president. Take With four weeks left, Kennedy trailed Humphrey by 20 percent. So his campaign turned up the heat, buying TV time to address head-on what his poster saw as growing concerns about Kennedy's Catholic religion. I don't happen to believe that one of those serious issues is where I go to church on Sunday. The strategy worked. Senator Kennedy crushed Humphrey with 60 percent of the vote. But more went into this victory than appeals to patriotism and fair play. It was common knowledge in West Virginia that county politicians could be swayed by cash. The Kennedys had it, lots of it, and used it. I offer my congratulations to my friend and Senate colleague, uh, Jack Kennedy. Humphrey dropped out, the newest victim of the Kennedy juggernaut. At the Democratic convention in July, Jack Kennedy, a few votes shy of the nomination, fought off a growing challenge from Lyndon Johnson. Johnson's people revealed that Kennedy suffered from Addison's disease, which, had the Kennedy people not succeeded in denying it, would have killed Jack's chances. Bobby Kennedy couldn't contain his anger. There were a number of uh, instances over the course of the 1960 convention where he approached Johnson people, waved his finger in someone's face and said, you Johnson people are going to get yours. So I come to you today full of admiration for Senator Johnson. But the yours Johnson's people ended up getting was to be Jack's pick for vice president. Kennedy had done his political calculus. He needed Texas electoral votes and he needed the local man on the ticket to get them. With the hard-fought nomination in hand, the Kennedy campaign fixed its sights on beating Richard Nixon. Contrasting Jack's vitality and promise to get the country moving again with a candidate tied to the status quo of the 1950s. The Republican nominee, of course, is a young man, but his approach is as old as McKinley. Nixon was thrown at first by the coldness and efficiency of the Kennedy frontal assault. He had known and liked Jack since they came to the House together in 1947. Jack's father had donated money to Nixon's Senate campaign. Jack hand-delivered the check to Nixon's office and even told newspaper columnist Charles Bartlett, a close friend, that he'd vote for Nixon for president if he, Jack, didn't get the nomination. But Jack Kennedy was not one to let political fellowship affect his game. Good evening. The television and Kennedy's team knew that the new medium of television was the way to persuade voters. His suntanned, radiant image was worth a thousand words and hundreds of thousands of votes. To exploit his edge on the tube, they brought in Bill Wilson, a seasoned TV producer. In the first presidential debate, Wilson made sure viewers saw lots of shots of the ashen-faced Nixon, who had famously refused to wear makeup. I wanted more reaction shots. I said, all right, you've gotten Kennedy seven times, we need six more on Nixon. And it was like night and day between before the debate and after the debate. The, the crowd was enormous. It was loud. It was noisy. Everyone is voting for Jack because he's got what all the rest lack. With a theme song by Frank Sinatra, the Kennedy campaign was far more glamorous than Nixon's. It also put Lou Harris's scientific polls to work in a way that had never been done before. Team Kennedy focused like a laser on winning big states and their electoral votes, while Nixon campaigned in all 50 states. We surveyed 38 states for Kennedy and wrote off about half the states. He had the guts to write off whole states and say, okay, I'm going to lose them. In the end, just 100,000 votes separated Kennedy and Nixon out of some 70 million cast, one-tenth of one percent. At 7.19 a.m. Eastern Time, Senator Kennedy was elected President of the United States. But true to their big state strategy, Kennedy had an overwhelming majority in the Electoral College. Kennedy has won 296 that alone is enough. In those big states, many of the voters were Catholic. Kennedy had turned an historic negative into an electoral positive. Kennedy played the Catholic issue extremely well, making sure that he got all the Catholic votes and had a minimum uh, reverse effect among non-Catholic voters. 
So now uh, my wife and I prepare for a new administration and uh, for a new baby. Thank you. The Kennedys have played politics perfectly, and their tough tactics continued as Jack picked his cabinet, listening to his father's advice that he needed to keep Bobby close at hand. I am uh, pleased to accept the position of the Attorney Generalship uh, of the United States. With Jack now in the White House and brother Bobby at justice, the stage was set for the era of Kennedy. Just as Jack had been a different type of politician, the Kennedy White House was unlike anything Americans had ever seen. Suddenly, we had a first family that was beautiful, stylish, with just the right touch of aristocracy. He took the best qualities of kind of the rich old wasp, old guard, and infused it with a kind of energy and vitality of rising immigrants. Just like Jack's hero, James Bond, we never saw JFK sweat. A political 007, President Kennedy was smooth, sophisticated, savoring the action. What was Jack Kennedy like? I think he was cool. My uncle, um, Jack, was um, dispassionate, detached, cool. Jesus, he was cool. What the country learned only later was how well this suave exterior hid a secret life, the risky affairs that, if revealed, could have ruined everything. His Addison's disease, which had almost killed him in 1947 and again during a 1954 back operation that required him to take steroids and a reliance on energy-boosting amphetamines, drugs which may have compromised his judgment. He was a Shakespearean character. Everything about his health was a lie. He looked like a god, but he was, as Bobby would say, if a mosquito bites my brother, the mosquito dies. But American knowing none of this had bigger worries. As the country faced numerous challenges, from the Bay of Pigs to the Berlin Wall. The toughest test came in October 1962, when U.S. spy planes photographed Soviet nuclear missile bases being built in Cuba, just 90 miles away. We will not prematurely or unnecessarily risk the course of worldwide nuclear war in which even the fruits of victory would be ashes in our mouth. Jack's key advisor during the 13 days of the Cuban crisis was his old campaign manager. Together, the Kennedy brothers came up with a creative solution. The U.S. put a naval quarantine in place while secretly agreeing to pull obsolete U.S. missiles out of Turkey. In exchange, the Soviets removed their missiles from Cuba. The crisis was averted. It was the Kennedys' finest hour. What did your dad say about it afterwards? Well, what he said is we avoid a nuclear holocaust, the end of the world. The Soviet Union. Back home, another issue was reaching the boiling point, civil rights. Kennedy knew that every step he took could hurt him in the upcoming 1964 election. He didn't want to move too fast. He didn't want to antagonize uh, southern white Democratic voters. So we had to stay with him. We had to continue to encourage him. He wanted to be able to say to southern Democrats that it's the, these people pushing me, they're putting pressure on me. I think if the president would sign an executive order declaring segregation unconstitutional on the basis of the 14th Amendment, this would do a great deal to lead us out of this dark night of uh, violence and prejudice which we still face in so many areas. In the spring of 63 in Alabama, fire hoses and police dogs were used to brutally disperse nonviolent protesters. Kennedy realized that it was becoming a moral issue, and as President of the United States, he had to respond. Spurred to action and pushed by Bobby, Kennedy delivered one of his most powerful addresses. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. 
The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities. Whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. By the fall of 1963, Kennedy had introduced a strong civil rights bill to Congress. His first thousand days had seen many successes. The Peace Corps, the Moon Program, negotiating a nuclear test ban treaty, and a growing economy. Among the failures, the increasingly troubled American commitment in Vietnam. In late November, President Kennedy and Jackie flew to Texas to do some political damage control for his approaching re-election campaign. On the 22nd, they landed in Dallas. Good evening. The essential facts are these. President Kennedy was murdered in Dallas, Texas. He was shot by a sniper hiding in a building near his parade room. A wave of sadness and horror swept the nation while the Kennedy family struggled to comprehend their loss. Even in her grief, the president's widow began to romanticize Jack's legacy. She coined the term Camelot to describe the Kennedy White House. Jacqueline Kennedy was one of the great PR women of all time, and uh, she really knew how to play, not just the press, but how to play the myth. Once Jackie labeled Camelot, what it did was remind later generations of the fact there was a moment when there was this young president. There was a moment when people believed that they could change the world. Our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man. The celebration of Jack's legacy elevated and enshrined the Kennedy brothers. It would become the foundation for not one but two attempted restorations. Now it was the next brother's turn to carry the Kennedy torch. Bobby, the tough behind the scenes enforcer, had to step forward to the spotlight. There's sort of an eerie feeling in there now as you see the effects of one president being moved out and the effects of the new president, President Johnson, coming in. Those who knew Bobby say that after his brother's death, he seemed in a trance. Yet even as he brooded, he began to actively position himself as Jack's rightful heir. In 1964, after Lyndon Johnson denied him the chance to be his vice president, Bobby resigned as attorney general and ran for the Senate from New York. He hadn't lived in the state since he was a boy, but the Kennedys were never ones to play by the rule book or wait their turn. No one committed to participating in public life can sit on the sidelines with so much at stake. Yet, facing taunts that he was a carpetbagger and haunted by the suspicion that the cheers were not for him but for his lost brother, Bobby had trouble finding his political footing. This is the largest minority of hecklers you've ever had. Well, I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know. I have them uh, elsewhere. I don't know. It was kind of tentative, and he didn't want to trade on his uh, brother's name. On the other hand, uh, he uh, didn't quite know what to say uh, on behalf of himself. Kennedy ended up defeating the popular incumbent Senator Ken Keating by riding on Lyndon Johnson's long presidential coattails. But even as the new senator joined his younger brother Ted on the Hill, he was poised for higher office, and everyone knew it. The feeling from most of those who watched him was that his presidential uh, years were almost inevitable. There was always that, uh, that feeling among the press and among his uh, colleagues that uh, one day they, they, they were going to have to deal with him on quite a different level. Robert Kennedy wasn't a cool politician like his older brother Jack. He was emotional, intense, full of passion. The inadequacy of human compassion, the defectiveness of our sensibility toward the sufferings of our fellows, they mark the limit of our ability to use knowledge for the well-being of our fellow human beings throughout the world. And as the Vietnam War death toll rose and protesters took to the streets, Bobby found his voice. 
Do we lose nothing by sitting down with the North Vietnamese and seeing if we can resolve this conflict? And I'm in favor of doing that. But even though he wanted to reclaim the White House, Bobby wasn't ready to take on the president who was expanding the war, a war his brother had backed. He was quite resolute that he wasn't going to run. But it became clear we couldn't really go through another four years of the Johnson presidency. Part of him said you don't undertake something unless you think you can win. Part of him said you, you have to do what's right. While Bobby anguished, another anti-war candidate stepped up, Minnesota Senator Eugene McCarthy. In March 1968, McCarthy, a virtual unknown, proved Johnson's clear vulnerability, losing the New Hampshire primary to the president by a handful of votes. A few days later, Bobby was in, announcing in the same Senate chamber his brother had. I do not run for the presidency merely to oppose any man, but to propose new policies. Many people saw Bobby's announcement as naked political calculation. You opportunists, you know, you waited until you saw that Lyndon was really vulnerable. You let uh, McCarthy pave the way and you follow in his wake. You know, it was an ill-timed, inopportune time to do it, but he did it. And so he was off and running. Robert Kennedy's impassioned 1968 campaign had little in common with the well-oiled Kennedy campaign machine that made Jack president eight years earlier. The Bobby Kennedy campaign. What was different about that from what you remember and knew about the Jack Kennedy campaigns? Well, it was a lot less organized. As you know, my father was very ambivalent as to whether to run, and so put, it was put together more in a haphazard way. It, it was the spirit that got you through rather than the organization. That same Ray. Are you going to vote for this man who sings like this? Yeah. There was this enormous, enormous surge everywhere he went of youthful enthusiasm. It was extraordinary, you know, grabbing and mauling him and snatching his cufflinks and kids on tricycles and bikes pumping along the motorcade. On March 31st, the Kennedy campaign had the floor fall out from under it. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Bobby had been running against Lyndon Johnson and his war policies, and now for a brief time, he was at sea. That changed on April 4th. I have some very sad news for all of you. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight. In Memphis. From that night in Indianapolis, his campaign had a new direction. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another and a feeling of justice toward those who still suffer within our country. He wasn't just running against a president or a war, but trying to heal a country's racial and economic wounds as well. Bobby went on to win in Indiana and then in Nebraska. But he lost the Oregon primary to McCarthy, a first for a Kennedy in presidential politics. To have any chance, Bobby needed to best McCarthy in California. On June 4th, 1968, he did just that, and won in South Dakota, too. For a brief moment, Bobby was atop a wave of excitement that might, just might have secured him the nomination. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Is there a doctor? Is there a doctor? Senator Robert Francis Kennedy died at 1.44 a.m. today, June 6, 1968. He was uh, 42 years old. I believe that Robert Kennedy uh, would have won. And I think he could have defeated Richard Nixon. And just think about it. No Nixon. War ends. 
no Watergate. What would this country have been like uh, over the ensuing 40 years? Oh. Present at the hospital, the youngest Kennedy brother, Ted. I saw him briefly, his face just contorted with grief. I've never seen a man so uh, torn as he was that night for all kinds of reasons. My brother need not be idealized or enlarged in death beyond what he was in life. To be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, saw suffering and tried to heal it, saw war and tried to stop it. It was that eulogy that turned Bobby Kennedy into the saintly liberal figure that we associate with Bobby Kennedy. So all along, it was Ted who was investing the Kennedy name with sort of concrete values, you know, civil rights, anti-war, um, health care, education. Um, and, and that is a key to their endurance, that people consider the Kennedys to be a fixed brand name. Now, there was only one brother left. Of the four Kennedy brothers, Ted the youngest was the most connected to the others. In 1946, the family gathered in Hyannisport to celebrate Jack's 29th birthday. When Teddy rose to speak, the 14-year-old raised his glass and said, I'd like to drink a toast to the brother who isn't here. He stunned the room into silence. I think the three of them were not only a kind of band of brothers all their own, in mythology, but in reality. In 1960, Ted was given a key role in Jack's campaign, overseeing the western states. Uh, in the state of Oregon, do give Jack an enthusiastic and overwhelming uh, endorsement. No when Jack's Senate seat came open in 1962, Father Joe made the call, declaring that Ted, all of 30 years old, would be the candidate. Jack and Bobby did not want Ted to run for the Senate. They felt he was too young. Joe said, no, it's his turn now. He's helped you, now you help him. There are hot times brewing on the Massachusetts political scene. At the state Democratic convention, Edward J. McCormick, 38-year-old nephew of House Speaker McCormick, seeks the party nomination for senator in a contest with Edward Ted Kennedy. The Kennedy operation swung into action, again, even dusting off Jack's slogan from 1952, he can do more for Massachusetts. Ted won. But the joy of Ted Kennedy's victory was sadly muted. Prior to his triumph, Joe Sr. suffered a debilitating stroke. But his fourth son was now on his way. And unlike his brothers, Ted found a home in the Senate. I think Teddy Kennedy was very happy being a senator. He just seemed more comfortable there within two days than either of the brothers may have felt being there for several years. Then on the night of July 18, 1969, with Kennedy poised to perhaps challenge Nixon in 1972, he drove off a bridge on an island near Martha's Vineyard. The passenger with him, Robert Kennedy staffer Mary Jo Kopechny, was killed. Kennedy said he was driving her back to catch a ferry to the vineyard when the accident occurred. There is no truth, no truth whatever, to the widely circulated suspicions of immoral conduct that have been leveled at my behavior and hers regarding that evening. There are many reasons to believe that they weren't heading to the ferry. First of all, she, Mary Jo, left her purse and her keys, her motel key, back at the cottage. They also didn't head for the ferry. They headed in a different direction over a dirt road heading out to the beach. And the ferry had stopped running more than a half hour before they left the party. It seemed that Ted Kennedy's political career and any hope at the presidency was over. But in 1970, just 16 months later, the people of Massachusetts overwhelmingly re-elected him to the Senate. In a May 1971 poll, he led all Democrats as a challenger to President Nixon's re-election. A Kennedy restoration still seemed possible. Nixon was not anxious for a rematch as becomes clear in the Watergate tapes. Hey, who knows about the Kennedy? Should take it, 
Teddy, uh, we are covering our uh, personal. So to do it in No. No, it's very clean. Very clean. Be careful now. Nixon got a break. Ted didn't run in 1972. The prime reasons uh, for not running is because of responsibilities to my, uh, to my family. That for is- Ted, being a Kennedy brother was a heavy burden. Senator, there is obviously a great price that one has to pay these days for political life. Is the price worth the pain? Well, I suppose it is. I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute... With Ted sitting out again in 1976, Jimmy Carter and the Democrats retook the White House. But Senator Kennedy had little affection for Carter, and vice versa. President Carter probably regarded Teddy Kennedy as a constant daily, hourly challenge. And for, uh, for the Kennedys, I thought they regarded Carter as um, sort of a bumpkin. In 1979, with Carter's popularity at a record low, Ted decided to revive the Kennedy Party and do what his brother Bobby did, run against a sitting Democratic president. Today, I formally announce that I'm a candidate for president of the United States. There did seem to be this family legacy to be satisfied to be the president, and more than that, He obviously knew from watching his brothers that the presidency had a power, that no matter how big a senator you could be, you could still do more for the things you cared about if you were president. He did it in some degree of discomfort because he's taking on a president of his own party. He also, I think, had personal reservations about whether, you know, his personal skills fit well with the presidency. That became clear after Kennedy agreed to a high-profile television interview with CBS's Roger Mudd, taped prior to announcing his candidacy. Why do you want to be president? Well, I'm... Uh, were I to, to make the, uh, the announcement and uh, to run, the reasons that I would run is because I have a great belief in this country. Unfortunately, Ted's campaign turned out much like his interview. Ill-prepared, unfocused, awkward, un-Kennedy. Of the 34 primaries, Carter won 24, Kennedy just 10. It wasn't a very well-run campaign, and it never got traction. I think the main reason was that, um, that he probably had not felt it in his, you know, in his skin that this was his destiny. At the convention, Ted gave more of an acceptance speech than what it was supposed to be, an endorsement of Carter. For me, a few hours ago, this campaign came to an end. For all those whose cares have been our concern, the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. They got to see the Ted Kennedy they should have gotten to see earlier in that campaign. By convention's end, with the balloons falling and the Democrats fetting President Carter, Kennedy speechwriter Bob Shrum quietly counseled Ted to be a good soldier and a team player. I looked at him and I said, you are going to raise his hand, aren't you? He said, yes. And he went up and I went out to the audience and it never happened. And some people in the crowd still shouting, we want Ted, we want Ted. You know, this is slightly awkward. And finally, I guess at the very end, there was some sort of, you know, brief hand touch, but it was on full view of the nation. This absolute physical contempt for the senator toward the president. The Kennedy campaign machine, which for decades had intimidated and destroyed political foes from Lodge to Humphrey to Johnson to Nixon, could now only wound... For those savoring a Kennedy restoration, the dream had been again deferred.